This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. At Military History Night on November the 16th, author and retired broadcaster Larry Rose discussed his new book, Ten Decisions, Canada's Best, Worst, and Most Far-Reaching Decisions of the Second World War. That being said, a warm welcome, and Larry, the floor is yours. Good evening. Thank you very much for inviting me, and thank you very much, Pat, for the introduction. I, I appreciate it. I think it's a, uh, a wonderful opportunity for me, and uh, it's great to look out and see some friends from Branch 165 and some other people that I've met in preparation to these books, and uh, some other friends from uh, RCMI. So it feels uh, very uh, relaxing and comfortable to be among friends. Um, I'm going to uh, speak for about 35 minutes or so, and then uh, welcome questions after that. Uh, the book, as uh, Pat mentioned, is called Ten Decisions, Canada's Worst, Best, Worst, and Most Far-Reaching Decisions of the Second World War. I have some copies over here that are for sale for uh, $25, and I have a few copies of Mobilize. So uh, I was at uh, book launch. The book launch was uh, about two weeks ago. And my pal Lloyd was there, and uh, as well Kirk Howard, the uh, publisher of Dundurn Books, and this is a Dundurn book. Um, it was great working with Lloyd all those years. It was a total of 14 years that I worked with him. And um, it was always fun being out in public because so many people recognized Lloyd and would, uh, would make a comment to him or about him or whatever, and you could just see their eyes, their eyes light up uh, the moment they spotted him. But you never quite knew what people were going to say. And I remember one occasion we were uh, sitting down having a bite to eat after a, one of the shows and this guy came beetling across the room with his hand out and Lloyd's kind of got good peripheral vision for this kind of thing. So Lloyd sort of stood up and stuck his hand out and the guy said, Lloyd Robertson! And Lloyd, he said, you're not as tall as you look on TV. <laughs> You're the, uh, I'll go through the 10 decisions. Obviously, we can't cover all of them in very much detail, so I'll just mention them, and then if there are any that I don't cover that you have particular interest in, I'm very happy to talk about them in uh, uh, the questions afterwards. But just very briefly, first of all, the decision to go to war itself. Most Canadians think it was kind of automatic that Canada would declare war, but that was far from the case because of French-Canadian opinion. Second one was the unloved Corvette. This is the little ship that became a legend in the Second World War and, and an icon of the Battle of the North Atlantic. Uh, nobody in the Navy in 1939 wanted it. It was about the last ship they wanted to have. So the fact that this unimposing little ship could become a legendary war winner is extraordinary. Third uh, decision is the Air Training Colossus, the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, starting from absolutely nothing to turn out 131,000 airmen in four years is unbelievable. Some people compared the project to the building of the CPR itself in majesty and in what it achieved. Decision for putting the Canadian and Royal Canadian Air Force this is when, in 1939, the RCAF of 4,100 members was a branch plant of the Royal Air Force. The training was British, the uniforms were British, the airplanes were British. Everything about the Royal Canadian Air Force was British, and it was totally dependent on the RAF. By 1945, things had been completely transformed. It was a standalone Air Force. It was a national Air Force, and achieving that was one of the great landmarks of, uh, for Canada in the Second World War. Decision 5, the appointment of C.D. Howe. This is the Minister of Supply and Munitions, uh, and Canada had one of the best-run uh, war production programs among the Allies. There were not um, competing empires the way there were in the United States and Britain. Canada's war producing uh, program was excellently run by C.D. Howe. 
Number six is the famous Augensburg Agreement, uh, about which I'm sure each of you knows a great deal. The name is undoubtedly familiar from all of the courses you took in high school about the Augensburg Agreement. Either that or nobody ever heard of it before. Uh, the Augensburg Agreement is not well known, but it's important because it was the first international defense agreement that, that Canada implemented, and it was a predecessor of NORAD and NATO and all the rest. It was signed in 1940. Dieppe, I'm sure, uh, is very familiar. It was uh, one of the worst decisions for Canada in the Second World War. Guy Simmons became, uh, Lieutenant General Guy Simmons became commander of two corps, and Simmons was the uh, greatest Canadian soldier of the Second World War. And in, Canadian, in all Canadian history, probably only one person uh, was greater. Uh, and there's the person standing right here, sitting right here over my shoulder. Uh, decision nine was the great, uh, the great political crisis, that's the conscription crisis of 1944 in particular, uh, which uh, threatened to split the country in half, as indeed did the first decision in 1939. And finally, from War to Peace, this is the transition. This is the, the veterans benefits programs, the baby bonus, a whole menu of social programs that took effect around the end of the war, some before, some afterwards. Uh, but if you group them together, they um, made for a so social safety net that we recognize today as being incredibly progressive. And the fact that the Mackenzie King government would have thought of this as far back as 1940 they started preparations for this is extraordinary. So those are the ten. Now the decision to go to war, the first decision, most people would think that <clears throat> Canada declaring war in 1939 was a given. It was expected. There was nothing controversial about it. But that was far from the case. On September 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland. On the 3rd, Britain and France declared war. And there was some question in Canada, was Canada at war? Because in the First World War, that was exactly the case. Britain declared war, and Canada was automatically at war. In fact, the British High Commissioner in Ottawa uh, was phoned by one of the um, press gallery people and said, is Canada at war? And he said he didn't know, but he thought they would be soon. Parliament was in recess, and Mackenzie King, the Prime Minister, did not want a war declaration without Parliament uh, passing it. And the reason that he did that is that he thought it was a statement of Canadian nationhood. King was a nationalist. He was very sentimental about the empire, and uh, he very much, in, in a lot of ways, his history went back to Victorian times. He was a, he was a Victorian in some respects. But politically and intellectually, he was a nationalist. And he wanted Canada's parliament to, to pass a motion to declare war as a statement of Canada standing alone. Now, um, this uh, remarkable picture here, and I'm sorry, it's kind of small, and I'm sure it's difficult. Can you, in the back, actually even see the writing? Or can you, there's not much I can do. I'll, I'll read the, uh, I'll read the, surtitles there because I think it's probably hard for you in the back. But this picture in the middle, and sorry I can't blow it up any bigger, is a remarkable photo. This was taken on September 7th, 1939, as Parliament considered the war declaration. It's unusual not only for its date, but because you're not allowed to take pictures of Parliament in session. I don't know how they did it. If you went into Parliament today, sat in the visitor's gallery, and snapped away with your camera, you would be pounced on by the security people very quickly, and the camera would be confiscated. You're not allowed to take pictures. So I don't know what the story is on this one, how it took place. The members are all standing, so I assume this is kind of, it looks like the speaker's in his chair. So um, this must have been prayers probably, just when they were uh, beginning their session. But anyway, it's September 7th, 1939, and um, Parliament is debating the war declaration. And, um, one of the key speakers in this debate that went on for two days was the man there on uh, your uh, right, uh, Ernest Lapointe. He was the justice minister and the leader of uh, the Quebecers in the government and in the cabinet. 
uh, a very senior uh, member of the king government, and he actually was literally a king maker. When Mackenzie King was running for the leadership of the Liberal Party in 1921, the whole issue hung in the balance. And Ernest Lapointe decided to stand with King. And that was, gave him just enough votes that he became Liberal leader. So what was unusual about uh, Ernest Lapointe's speech is that he supported the war declaration. That is in spite of the overwhelming opinion of people in Quebec. People in Quebec totally opposed Canada going to war because they thought it would bring on another divisive um, event of conscription. So this is strange. How is it that uh, Ernest Lapointe, a leader of Quebec, where everybody hates the whole idea, could stand in the House of Commons and say that this motion, he was going to support this motion because it is for Canada's honor, Canada's soul, Canada's dignity, Canada's conscience. The speech was unbelievable. Now, uh, and as I said, this goes back to 1917 when there were conscription riots in Quebec and the country teetered on the edge of civil war. Uh, in the whole intervening period, Quebec public opinion had been totally against uh, any kind of new war declaration. They considered it an imperial war and they said Canada isn't being invaded. Why should we be worried about yet another bloodbath in Europe just like the last one? Now, um, that uh, the justice minister would have this opinion and say so in Parliament despite the opposition, was a result of two main things. One was the continued outrages by Hitler, another invasion, another conquest, another country gobbled up. So the events in Europe drove Canadian public opinion together. But also, for French and English Canada, the principal event or the principal reason that there was uh, unanimity in 1939, in September, was a unity campaign by Mackenzie King. He realized after Munich in 1938 that there was going to be a war. He had been a strong supporter of appeasement and he was a strong supporter of Chamberlain. But after Munich, he completely changed. He realized uh, English Canadians were going to demand Canada declare war if Britain became involved. And not only that, that was his personal opinion too. He, that, he agreed with that stand. So, King, but King realized the French public opinion would not stand for it. So it was kind of a three-step process. First, he had to bring the cabinet on board. Then he had to bring parliament on board. And finally, he had to bring the country on board. So there was a January uh, cabinet meeting in 1939. And uh, Ernest Lapointe, at that, at that time, said that he thought he would have to resign from the government if uh, there was going to be a war declaration. And so would all the other French-Canadian cabinet ministers, and so would many of the uh, uh, liberals uh, in Parliament. King's response was, if you do that, then we are back to 1917 with the Union government. You're going to have an English Canadian government. Does that in any way advance your cause? And so after reflection, Lapointe's views began to change, and so did some of the other cabinet ministers. And finally, uh, finally there was a kind of an agreement worked out. And, and uh, King and Lapointe were able, King, uh, Lapointe stayed in the government, and King was able to persuade him and others to stay as well. And here was the deal that they kind of reached, a modus vivendi, if you will. No neutrality, no conscription. What that, now, this wasn't, this wasn't the way it was stated. It, this, this came afterwards. This is the description that, that came to be attached to this process. But it wasn't there at the time. They weren't sitting around saying, well, what about neutrality? Yeah, what about conscription? No neutrality meant that Canada would not remain neutral if Britain declared war. 
no conscription meant exactly that for, for uh, French Canada, that there would be uh, volunteers only. Um, so finally, uh, King was able to persuade uh, the French Canadian ministers and that this was the formula that they used, which they reached in about the spring of 1939. And uh, uh, the justice minister at that point, Lapointe, did in fact support uh, King on that basis. So when 1939, when uh, September 1939 came along, there was a, an understanding between French Canada and English Canada. French Canadian opinion was still strongly against it. But uh, in, a, in a moment of incredible courage, really, uh, the uh, Justice Minister standing up and declaring that he supported King in this ma matter and supported a war declaration was really uh, a very marvelous thing to see. So instead of Canada entering the war as a divided nation, which would have been involved in turmoil for months and would have totally undermined the uh, Canadian war effort in 1939-1940 and onward, Canada was able to, uh, to enter the war on, the, on this kind of basis, an understanding between French and English Canada. And remember, the thing about Canada has always been this, that uh, it's a nation of compromise, it's a nation that has a minority that you can't ignore. You can't have vote after vote after vote in Parliament in which you say, okay, English Canadians all in favor, French Canadians opposed, oh, English Canada won again. Okay, next vote, English Canada all in favor, oh, we won again, we won again. You cannot keep doing that and keep the country together. There has to be an accommodation uh, between the two uh, founding, or the two peoples. And, and this was what King was able to achieve. As uh, my friend George McDonnell said, he kept the country together. And that's the way Canada entered the war in 1939. So on September 10th, 1939, Canada entered the war as a united country. This was a far-reaching decision. In fact, Desmond Morton, a distinguished historian, has offered the view that bringing Canada into the war as a united country was the greatest achievement in the long career of Prime Minister Mackenzie King. It, so this was important not just because Canada declared war in its own right for the first time, but that it did not fracture the nation in two in the process. Now, the second decision, ordering the Corvette. Um, this was one of the best Canadian decisions of the war in early 1940. Canada ordered 64 Corvettes. Um, the ship became a war winner. It was the stand-in that became a star in the Battle of the Atlantic. No one in their wildest imagination would have thought that such a dinky, an unimposing little boat would have become such a legend. You think of the legendary ships of history, you think of HMS Victory and his whatever it was, 96 guns and his majestic sails, or you think of a battleship and it's 50,000 tons of firing a, as they, we always used to say in news, firing a shell the weight of a Volkswagen 16 miles. And I don't know why we always described it that way, but we did. Uh, or a mighty aircraft carrier. Uh, uh, Battleship in the Second World War was around 50,000 tons. You know, we're bigger than the smaller ones, but roughly speaking. Destroyer was around three or 4,000 tons. This was 970 tons. It was tiny. It wasn't even a real warship. It was designed in 1895 to hunt whales. All it was was a simple civilian ship. They stuck a gun on the front, an anti-aircraft gun on the back, and uh, they put some explosives uh, on the side so they could drop them over the side and, uh, and hunt, sub uh, hunt submarines, and that became the Corvette. Uh, some basics about it. Um, it was, uh, I said, 950 tons. It went 16 knots, which isn't exactly speedy. It was very simple. The boilers were, were very commercial boilers, uh, so that anybody who'd worked on the CPR in engines at all could operate them. Uh, the four-inch gun on the uh, foredeck there, I'm going to switch to a better picture of it here. 
Uh, this one doesn't actually have the gun, <laughs> gun on the front, but you can, this one's right out of the builder's yards. It doesn't even have a number on the side. So this is brand new. Um, but it, it, um, it had a, a four inch gun on the front, on the foredeck that couldn't actually hit anything because it didn't have any fire control. But what it would do is, is fire the gun and a U-boat on the surface would then dive and, uh, and then they could use their uh, anti-submarine gear to try and hunt it, depth charges and so on. Uh, it was simple to operate, so the crews didn't require the same level of training as, say, a destroyer. Um, the crews, I should say something about, because, you know, many of them were absolutely green. They had been civilians, in some cases, 90 days before they went to sea. Some of them were seasick before the ship left the harbor. Uh, they, they were completely untrained, most of them. They wore their turtleneck sweaters and their baseball hats or whatever else came to hand. Nobody cared too much about what they wore. And they, the main object in the early part of the war with the early Corvettes was simply to stay off the rocks and get to the other shore because they had no training. So um, the, the um, 64 of these ships were ordered. You can see, for instance, look at the mast in front of the wheelhouse there. Uh, you know, that's not the best place in the world to put a mast. Uh, the people in the wheelhouse are kind of going like this or maybe like that, trying to see around it. The, uh, the forecastle on the side there, you can see, if you follow the line of the uh, top here, I'll maybe just show you. Along here, down to here, uh, this is what's called a short forecastle corvette. And later on in the war, they moved that, uh, the top part there further back, so it was much more seaworthy. But the ship was always wet, and a lot of water washed in over the sides and so on. So uh, the sailors were always wet from the moment they went aboard to the moment they got to the other side of the Atlantic. Um, no one imagined that this ship would be a deep sea ship. It was meant as a coastal ship. It was meant to go up and down, the coast, two, three days, four days, maybe, back to port. But the fact is, the German submarines were moving further out into the central Atlantic, and there were no vessels, they had nothing else. So, this little ship became a deep sea escort, uh, by default. So, um, by 1940 or 41, big convoys in the middle of the Atlantic were escorted by corvettes. Um, there are many episodes of strange and bizarre th heroic things uh, that happen on Corvettes, but I'll just tell you one of them. And you may know about this episode, it's fairly famous. This is HMCS Oakville, and actually it was in the Caribbean, not in the North Atlantic. Oakville was in company with American aircraft and American ships. And one of the American aircraft spotted a German submarine on the surface, and uh, drove it underwater. Uh, it called for help from the surface ships and Oakville was closest. So Oakville sped to the scene as much as you can speed at 16 knots and, um, and then uh, dropped depth charges and the, uh, damaged the U-boat which then came to the surface. Um, this was U-94 and it took place just off Haiti. Uh, so Oakville sent a boarding party uh, to get on the submarine to try and get the Enigma machines, code breaking machines, and any secret codes it could. So among the boarding party were these two uh, men on your right, um, Sub Lieutenant Hal Lawrence and Petty Officer A.J. Powell. Uh, and in the process, 19 members of the U-boat crew surrendered. But as you can see in the poster on the, on the other side there, uh, on the right, um, they went aboard the uh, submarine and um, jumped down the conning tower to try and get the code books. They were unsuccessful uh, and they had to face uh, one of the German uh, sailors who attacked them, which, and they shot him. Uh, but anyway, they finally barely escaped with their lives, and, uh, but they were awarded medals for heroism because they nearly died in that process. And uh, so this, the result was this famous war poster and it was printed by the thousands uh, after this, uh, you know, kind of hair-raising incident. 
And um, the uh, poster, although famous, is inaccurate in one respect. And uh, the friends from uh, Royal Canadian Navy here will know that, uh, in actual fact, uh, uh, Sub-Lieutenant Lawrence had fallen into the water off the boat that was trying to land on the U-boat, lost his shorts, and the entire episode was done au naturel. <laughs> there were, um, there were uh, new ships by about 1943 called the Frigate. It was a bigger, this is not a Frigate, this is a Corvette. Um, the, the day of the Corvette really ended about 1943. It was still used after that. It was still built after that. But really, it, its days were numbered, and the frigate took over the kind of frontline responsibility for the, um, for the Battle of the Atlantic. Now, this is the one and only remaining Corvette uh, in the world. And this is HMCS Sackville. It's in Halifax. If you're ever there, do go aboard. It's a museum ship, and it's there in the summer. It's incredibly interesting and well worth it. Uh, the time I went on board, I stuck my head down just below the main deck, and I looked to the stern, like this, looked to the bow, and you can see the stern, and you can see the bow. There are no compartments. So one torpedo would usually do it, and some of these sank in about three minutes, you know? Is a very, very dangerous ship to be on. But you can see how different this um, Sackville is. Sackville is a late Corvette. You can see how different it is. The mast, for one thing, is moved behind the bridge. The bridge is much bigger than it was before. If you look at the bow, or as we in the Army used to call it, the pointy end, um, you can see the shear is different. Uh, they've improved the shear of the, uh, the bow. And... Um, and the ship has been improved in a hundred different ways, including the late radar that was put on board. So um, I think we have to, to remember that um, the main thing about the Corvette is not that it was a great ship in and of itself. What was really great about the Corvette was the fact that it was there when there was nothing else. That was really the remarkable thing about it. It's extraordinary because the Battle of the Atlantic was a near-run thing. It was incredibly close. And Germany came very close to uh, starving Britain to death. And at the worst of the Battle of the Atlantic, ships were being sunk faster than they could be built. And that is a recipe for disaster. So the Corvette, ordering the Corvette, was one of the great decisions for Canada in the Second World War. The third decision is the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. Um, on the, uh, the bigger picture there is the Harvard, and a lot of you probably, or some of you, probably flown in them. Anybody flown in a Harvard? Yeah, oh, one here in the back. Where was it? Was it here? Yeah, I, I'm too young to have flown in it during the war. Yeah. But uh, the Canadian Warbird Heritage yeah. offers... Uh, in Hamilton. In Hamilton, yeah. offers flights. And yeah. It's, it's a remarkable aircraft. Yeah, a remarkable aircraft. Um, but the, and oh, and the, the other picture, the, the smaller picture, you may recognize as Marshall McLuhan School. Now, why would I put Marshall McLuhan School in something to do with the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan? And the answer is that where Marshall McLuhan School is located at Eglinton and Avenue Road, I believe, uh, was the site of the old Hunt Club. And... Uh, the Hunt Club was one of literally dozens of existing buildings that were taken over by the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan when there was nothing else. So they didn't do any flying at the old Hunt Club, but they did basic training there. And this was one of the ways they got the BCATP off the ground, was using as much existing uh, building as possible. But, you know, when, the thing about the... Uh, Commonwealth Air Training Plan is the size of it. I mean, it's just, it's, it's staggering. I'll give you a couple of examples. It says, uh, at the beginning, they imagined or thought that they would need 3,540 aircraft, training aircraft. It was impossible. It was impossible. Where would you ever get that number of training aircraft? 
and an Air Force that had 4,000 members in it. They needed 720 Harvard aircraft alone, never mind the other kind. They would have to have 80 air bases and airfields built almost all from scratch. Each would include hangars, water plants, roads, electrical connections, and on each base there would have to be instructors, administrators, ground crew, security staff, radio operators, supply and weapons specialists, doctors, nurses, and dozens of more. So this started from nothing in December. So the deal was signed in December 1940. Um, so this turned out to be one of the greatest contributions to victory in the Second World War because, as I said, 131,000 graduates. Um, Britain would never have been able to take the air war to Germany. Canada and Britain would not have been able to without all these thousands of uh, air training graduates. So it is one of the greatest contributions to victory in the Second World War and one of the best and most far-reaching decisions of the war. The, uh, oh, I've skipped one here. How do we do this? Uh, uh, oh, no, I was going to, I'm sorry, I was going to mention a little bit about Russ Bannock. Sorry, um, I was thinking this was in the next chapter. Uh, Wing Commander Russ Bannock um, was a good example of, um, now, we saw him on Tuesday. He was out to uh, an event at Sunnybrook Hospital with uh, Branch 165 of the Legion. Just had his 98th birthday on November 1st. He was a young pilot in um, September 1939. He was a commercial pilot. He just got his pilot's license. So he enlisted in the RCAF and just couldn't wait to be sent overseas. Wrong. Next four years, he spent as a, uh, a flight instructor with the BC ATP. And that was so frustrating for so many uh, young men who were just raring to go and raring to get involved in the, uh, in the fighting in Britain. But uh, they all had to be held back for uh, training because there was nobody else. Fortunately for uh, Wing Commander Bannock, in 1944 he got his chance. He was posted overseas. And the aircraft he flew at that time is the Mosquito, which I'm sure some of you will recognize. It's a two, two crew member uh, aircraft used in a whole bunch of different wars and, uh, roles, including fighter, bomber, and bomber, and so on. Reconnaissance, very versatile aircraft. And Russell Bannock gained fame for shooting down 19 of the V-1 rockets. So that's a precursor of the, uh, the cruise missile of today. Right? And the thing about the V1s is that they were faster than a mosquito, so they had to dive uh, to be able to catch up with them, could not shoot at them from the rear because the debris and the bomb on board would blow up your own aircraft, so it had to be attacked from three-quarter angle and in a dive, and you got one pass because the thing was going so fast. So Russell Bannock uh, was typical of many young Canadians of the time. He uh, he had to wait his turn for three or four years before he could get into the, uh, the fighting in Europe. Uh, one other thing I should mention about the British uh, Commonwealth Air Training Plan, and that is that it, um, it um, garnered the attention of Hollywood in uh, a movie uh, that was made about the BCATP called Captains of the Clouds. And uh, it, it, this was a good example of the wartime propaganda movies, and there were many of them all designed to try to galvanize public opinion in the United States. Because, of course, at that point early on, the United States was isolationist, right? So the idea was to try and mobilize public opinion and, and get it involved uh, in the fighting in Europe. And one of the funny things about it, this particular movie was um, James Cagney, the star, actually hated flying and took the train everywhere when he possibly could. Now, I'll see if I can uh, get a little example here.
Anyway, you get the idea that these these propaganda movies were very very important in uh, in terms of uh, mobilizing public opinion. And uh, among the people who got to star in this movie was uh, Billy Bishop. Billy Bishop played himself in a couple of scenes. A lot of it was shot at Uplands Airport in uh, in Ottawa, and some of it was shot up at Algonquin Park. Kind of unusual. The uh, British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. Uh, flew summer, winter, day, night, rain, hail, snow, whatever. And it showed that some of the, uh, some of the results of that were that there was a very high accident rate. These are very inexperienced people. The pressure's on to get them trained. And there were a, quite a phenomenal number of accidents. I remember hearing one where a plane landed in a, uh, on top of a hangar that was filled with other aircraft jammed with other aircraft, all of which were totally fueled and ready to go, and the whole thing went up. Um, so it was, um, there were a lot of, a lot of casualties uh, in, in wartime that didn't necessarily involve combat. Now, so that's the BCATP. Now, the next is the uh, Canadianization of the RCF. I think I sort of explained a little bit about, um, about what was involved there, and that is that the, the Air Force became a real national Air Force by the end of the war. And the thing that I've kind of pegged this on, if you will, is the formation of number six group RCAF. That was done on October 25th, 1942. Uh, number six group was set up. Now, six group may not mean very much to a lot of people, but there were 14 squadrons in number six group, and each squadron had about 16 aircraft. So you can see that's a very, very big, uh, that's like over 200 aircraft in uh, number six group. And of course, many of them were flying the legendary uh, Lancaster, which again is the Hamilton. This is the one of two um, Lancasters flying in the world. This is the one based in Hamilton. And uh, so many of the Canadian squadrons at the end of the war were flying Lancasters, and they were flying, flying Lancasters that were built at Malton. Uh, this was one of the great projects of, uh, that C.D. Howe undertook, was to build the Lancaster, which was incredibly complex aircraft for an air industry uh, that barely existed in 1939. So I just wanted to give you a quick idea of, uh, of the price that uh, these airmen paid in being a part of Bomber Group and the sacrifices they made for Canada in the Second World War. Roughly speaking, a person joining the bombing campaign uh, had, this would be between 42, or 42 and onward, roughly speaking, a person joining the bombing campaign had a one in two chance of surviving 30 combat missions. For every 100 airmen who joined the bombing campaign between 1942 and the end of 1944, 51 were killed in operations. Nine more were killed in non-operational accidents. 12 became prisoners of war. Three were badly wounded. Of the original 100, only 24 remained unscathed. That is just staggering uh, to realize the price that the Bomber Command paid. All right, I'll move on then. Uh, oh, I did want to mention one more thing. Uh, uh, Albert Wallace. This, uh, this, about two weeks ago at Curling, some guy gave me a book called Survival, and it was about this fellow, Albert Wallace, who was in Bomber Command, who was shot down in 1943. So anyway, I read the book. Yeah, very, very interesting book. He was involved uh, tangentially in The Great Escape. He was one of the penguins. That is, he carried the dirt. Uh, right, that they had to spread all over the ground that couldn't be detected. He was a penguin. Um, he survived uh, the war, obviously, uh, even that death march at the very end of the war. But anyway, uh, so on Tuesday, I finished the book on that morning. I went to this luncheon, and he's sitting at the same table. I couldn't believe it. Stunning. He's one of the people who, he's 90, how old, Donna, four, 95, 94. And he's one of the people who pushes other people around in wheelchairs. You know, he's a volunteer and has been a volunteer for 24 years. Unbelievable. So I told you about the casualties there. Uh, now, 
All right, the next one, the Minister of Everything, C.D. Howe. Um, his appointment is, was one of the most far-reaching uh, decisions of the war. He was appointed uh, Minister of Munitions and Supply in the spring of 1940. It was a very bad moment because it was just before the Germans were invading France. So it was a very dark moment in the war. Um, just a bit about him. Uh, he was an American, actually, but uh, not at this point. At this point, he'd become a Canadian, but he was born in the United States in Massachusetts in 1886. He was an engineer. He graduated from MIT. Uh, he didn't have a job. He came to Halifax, uh, became a professor there, then went on to set up uh, his own company and worked for the government a little bit earlier, uh, building grain elevator terminals. He became rich. He was the best grain terminal elevator builder in the country. He did it better, cheaper, faster. And he became a very wealthy man. So it wasn't so much that C.D. Howe was a politician or indeed that he was an engineer. It's that he was a superb businessman. He was just superb at running big organizations. Um, there were failures in the program, but those failures were uh, much uh, overshadowed by the successes uh, of the Canadian war supply program. And I'll give you a few examples here. First of all, one of the great successes of the war, I call the ugly truck. It's actually called the Canadian military pattern truck. And uh, it is pretty ugly, I think. Um, it came in various shapes and sizes and was used in all kinds of different ways. Uh, this is the three-quarter ton version. It came in a two-ton version or one-ton version. It was used as an ambulance, used for headquarters, used for moving troops. It was used for all kinds of signals, truck, and so on. And this incredibly versatile truck was turned out by the thousands by Chevrolet, by General Motors, and by Ford. And it was a war winner by itself almost. Um, in 1944 and 45, 30% of the wheeled vehicles in the British Army were Canadian. So this truck, the Canadian military pattern truck and other Canadian vehicles, uh, supplied the entire uh, Canadian Army and the British Army and some were sent to Russia and other places. The other Commonwealth countries used these vehicles. Incredibly successful vehicle. Now, why does it have that snub nose, right? Looks kind of, as I said, ugly. Uh, why would they have such a peculiar design? And the answer is that the engine was kind of almost underneath the driver. And a vehicle like this saved precious space on cargo ships. You could get many more of this truck on a cargo ship than you could a standard vehicle. And that's why this very unusual design was adopted. And I don't know if you're like me, but after the war, uh, when I was a young kid, uh, it seemed like every wrecker you ever saw was one of these, right? They were everywhere for a long time and ran forever and ever and ever. But, uh, but you know, you don't see many of them now except sort of on auto shows. One of um, Howe's big successes was um, uh, artificial rubber. The natural rubber uh, was taken over by the Japanese in Malaya, Malaya and so on. So Canada and the US and Britain didn't have any rubber tires. One of the uh, projects that um, was undertaken uh, by C.D. Howe was to build uh, an artificial rubber plant in Sarnia, and it was a huge success. It became the Polymer Corporation, which is a name some of you might remember through the 1950s. Canada produced $11 billion worth of munitions, uh, 1,400 Valentine tanks, 800,000 vehicles, not CMP, but 800,000 trucks, 16,418 aircraft, 410 merchant ships, 206 corvettes, 40% of all allied aluminum. Canada became the fourth greatest industrial power among allies. And at its peak, there were about a million Canadians working in war-related industries, about the same as the number who served in the Canadian forces. So um, 
As I said, the, the uh, notion I serve time with C.D. Howe became one of the great uh, hallmarks of businessmen in the post-war years. All right, we'll just do two more then and stop. Uh, I'll cover DF fairly briefly, but uh, August 19th, uh, 1942 was the worst day in Canadian military history. Out of the 554 members of the Essex Scottish Regiment, 52 returned to Britain when the operation was over. Of the 6,086 men who made it ashore, 3,367 were killed, captured, or wounded, a rate of nearly 60%. Casualties in the one-day operation in Dieppe, 60%. Why did Dieppe, oh, well, this is what the Dieppe operation looked like. On the two outside uh, arrows, those were commando operations designed to take out uh, German heavy guns on the high cliffs surrounding uh, Dieppe. The two, the blue and the green ones, were the um, outside attacks, also on high positions around Dieppe. Dieppe was shaped like an amphitheater. The, the Canadians had to land at the bottom of the amphitheater. The Germans were arrayed all around the rest of the amphitheater and on top. So the red and the uh, white arrows were where the main force landed. And here's what that beach looked like a couple of days after, or perhaps the day after, I'm not sure. Uh, and you can see how far the soldiers would have had to go to get cover. And in the meantime, the German guns were where this picture was taken from, right? The gunners were sitting up on these cliffs firing straight down and actually in straight across the beach. And there were other positions around as well. So you can see how suicidal it really was to, to try and land there for those uh, soldiers. The, the one, Dieppe failed for many reasons. One of the reasons, or the principal reason it, it did not fail was because of the heroism of the soldiers. There was no shortage of heroism uh, on the part of any of the Canadian soldiers who landed at Dieppe. That had nothing to do with why it failed. They did everything they possibly could. So there's that cliff I was talking about, and there's Dieppe today. Uh, you can see that building has been removed, and there's a recreation center there now. Dieppe failed because it was a frontal attack on a defended port. Frontal attacks, one would have thought, had ended in the First World War, right? That's what, that's what was so disastrous about the First World War, was that they, all they did were these frontal attacks again and again and again with stupendous casualty figures. But for some reason, even by the time of Dieppe, they still thought doing a frontal attack on a defended port was a good idea, which is unbelievable. Um, it was set up in such a way that if the first part of the plan failed, the rest would fail. And the first part of the plan was to take out those guns up on the hills, right? They failed, so the whole rest of the thing was doomed, and there's nothing else that they could do about it. It depended on split-second timing, but the timing failed, because uh, in some cases, the uh, landing craft landed late. The uh, Royal Navy and Royal Canadian Navy <coughs> sailors who were piloting these vessels it's just dark, of course, couldn't find their way, and they were 15 minutes late getting on the main beach. 15 minutes doesn't sound like much, but it's the difference between half light and full light at dawn. Um, it depended on surprise, but part of the attacking force ran into a German convoy in the middle of the uh, uh, English Channel and uh, was discovered. Uh, the intelligence was absolutely terrible. Some of the intelligence they used were postcards of Dieppe from before the war. That was one of the valuable sources they had for intelligence. But the most troubling thing about Dieppe was this. After three years of war, the British and Canadians could not plan and carry out a successful one-day operation. What did this mean for an operation like Normandy? The answer is, that Normandy would be a long way off. That's the real lesson of what happened in Dieppe, that they weren't ready. There had to be an awful lot of work done yet. And here's an example of some of the, some of the terrible things that happened to the soldiers who 
landed there. This is the um, Hamilton Spectator. Uh, the, it's a week after, actually, the uh, Dieppe raid, but look at that. Heavy toll of Royal Hamilton Light Infantry soldiers at Dieppe, nine officers, eight men already listed as dead. That's from Hamilton alone, and that was the early part of the casualty list. Casualty list kept coming for days afterwards. So you can see this is just a horrifying result. Two Canadian officers in the upper corner there, General McNaughton, and the lower corner, General Crerar, uh, were, in my opinion, uh, uh, able to stop the Dieppe operation and chose not to. I think uh, we always think of Dieppe as a kind of a British operation, and in many respects it was. But in the final analysis, the two senior Canadian officers had it in their power to decide not to go or to demand changes, but they did not. Uh, in the middle is Admiral Mountbatten, and Mountbatten was the head of combined operations that planned the whole thing. The curious, one of the many, many strange things about Dieppe is that, that Naya, the careers of none of these men were really affected by it. Uh, Mountbatten then went on to become the Viceroy of India and became a chief of the Imperial General Staff and so on. Um, in, uh, in the 1960s, the BBC did, uh, I believe, a six-hour uh, autobiography of Admiral Mountbatten. And I think Dieppe had about eight minutes uh, of that. He simply said, for every life lost at Dieppe, Ten lives were saved at Normandy. It just wasn't true. Any corporal, any officer just out of officer training, any second lieutenant could have said that a, a direct frontal assault on a defended port was a lousy idea, and yet there was kind of a group think that took over, and they went ahead with it. So it's still today, I think even today, there's, some, there's something about Dieppe, at least for me anyway, and I think for many people, there's something about it that's just kind of not answered. We just have not got the answers about this. Uh, it just somehow seems unfinished. All right, uh, I'll uh, stop then with, um, use this as the last uh, chapter. This is Lieutenant General Guy Simmons. Uh, Simmons' uh, appointment to command two corps was one of the great Canadian decisions of the war. Simmons was the most compelling, the most written about, the most discussed Canadian commander of the Second World War. Field Marshal Montgomery said at one point, there was only one outstanding Canadian general in the uh, war in Europe, and that was Guy Simmons. And that was uh, no, no small praise because Montgomery was notoriously critical of most uh, of his uh, fellow senior officers. Simmons was born in Britain, but grew up mostly in Victoria. Uh, he had a terrible time as a young boy. His parents were split, and his mother was receiving money from Britain from the father, and she spent every nickel of it on herself. And there were four kids. They never got anything um, for the rest of his life, even into his 50s. Uh, Simmons had to deal with these outbreaks from Victoria of his mother demanding more money. So it was very difficult for him. He had to get a loan from the commandant of RCM, uh, RMC to finish the RMC course in the 1920s. Um, he was, uh, Simmons was commander of the Canadian Division in Sicily and proved himself as a divisional commander. Uh, Canadians did well in Sicily and the reason that commentators said was Lots of artillery and Guy Simmons. With the D-Day operation, uh, the sharp end would be two corps, two Canadian corps. Uh, and Simmons was appointed in uh, January of 1944 to command it. Uh, he is most remembered, perhaps, for uh, Operation Totalized, which was leading up, it was uh, about uh, three weeks, if I recall, after D-Day, a month perhaps, and this was before they got to Falaise. And you can see these soldiers there in the bigger picture riding in this odd-looking vehicle. And uh, it's the bottom part of it, where the treads are, is actually a, the hull of a ram tank, a Canadian-made tank. The second part was originally where there was 
uh, an artillery piece put on. And they took out the artillery piece and put in this armor they scrounged from a whole bunch of places and put in the soldiers inside. And of course, in an operation, they wouldn't be standing up like that, right? They're just standing up because they're driving along the road. They would be hunched down in there. And what was remarkable about this vehicle is that really it was one of the very first armored personnel carriers ever used. And the problem in Normandy had always been that the infantry was not able to keep up with the tanks, right? You couldn't penetrate through three layers of German defenses because the infantry could not possibly keep up. So this was Simmons' idea of how the infantry would keep up. You put them in these vehicles and they uh, put them in a line right behind the tanks and off the two of them would go at the same speed. So that was really innovative. The other thing about Operation Total Eyes was that the big problem the Canadians had was that the German tanks could uh, uh, outrange the Canadian tanks. In other words, German Panther tanks could destroy half a regiment of Sherman tanks before the Shermans could get close enough to fire their weapons and be effective. And the same with the 88 uh, guns that were uh, anti-tank guns firing at Canadian tanks. Simmons' solution was very novel, and that was you do the attack at night. That neutralized the uh, advantage of the German, uh, Germans outranging Canadian tanks and infantry. So uh, Total Eyes was, uh, was an extraordinary battle. It was not completely successful, uh, in part because the second phase of Total Eyes called for bombers, and the bombers... Uh, bombs fell short and uh, they ended up killing an awful lot of Polish uh, soldiers and Canadian soldiers as well and that was one of the reasons why the attack toward Falaise kind of lost momentum. So the, the, one of the differences between say Guy Simmons and the Canadian Corps in the First World War was that he couldn't really claim a total victory in the same way as Vimy or the Hundred Days, right? There, for the Canadian Army, there really wasn't a Vimy. There wasn't a Hundred Days. And part of the reason was that the Vimy and the Hundred Days came after three years of training, right? The Canadian forces in the First World War had been fighting for three years and had plenty of time to shake down, get good commanders, good battle doctrine, and so on. Uh, in the Second World War, Total Eyes came just a few weeks after the Canadians had landed in Normandy. So it was not a complete success. There is Total Eyes. You can see the uh, attack south toward uh, Falaise and Trun. That's um, Falaise on the left, by the way. I was there a few years ago. God, it's just astounding to see... Uh, to see today you would never... You never see if there's even a hint of it. And by the way, you can see in the foreground there one of those CMP trucks. So uh, the, the next big operation that um, Guy Simmons went on to was uh, the Battle of the Scheldt. Uh, this was the, one of the most successful Canadian operations of the war, but ironically is not well known. Uh, it was fought in uh, Holland where the land was uh, saturated with water. They uh, knocked down some of the, um, the um, walls there that were keeping the land dry and, uh, and so the whole thing was kind of a muddy mess and it was extremely difficult to, uh, to attack. They used amphibious vehicles a great deal and a lot of Navy support and that is considered the finest uh, achievement of of Simmons' career, and then uh, the Canadian, went, Canadian Army went on to uh, 1945, and Jack uh, Granistein called it the best little army in the world. So the Canadian Army got better and better and better. So finally, I'm just going to um, just going to read one, the last paragraph of uh, the book here, and then I'll stop, or right, then I'll answer questions. The Second World War is now more than 70 years behind us, and those who experienced it firsthand are vanishing before our eyes. 
Well, much about the story of the war can be placed in some kind of perspective, or perhaps put at some distance. For Canadians, not all of it can. Among the red and blue flowers strewn through the Canadian War Cemetery at Ortona in Italy, there are graves with a maple leaf design on them and a simple inscription, a soldier of the 1939-1945 war. How can one visit that cemetery or the one at Beni sur Mer in Normandy or the one at Sai Wan Bay in Hong Kong and not be moved to tears? How can one see the wreaths float gently in the waters off Halifax on Battle of the Atlantic Sunday or witness the missing man formation in a fly past on Remembrance Day and not feel an ache? How can one stand on the beach at Dieppe knowing that on August 19th, 1942, so many young men with lives still to live and with family longing for them to return were cut down on that very spot. What happened in those years is not simply history. It cannot simply be confined to the past. It whispers to us yet. Thank you. Are there questions? And uh, I know there is no microphone, so I'll try, because we are recording this, I'll try to repeat the question if there are if there are any, and uh, so everybody uh, can hear on the video recording. Eric. Um, Larry, uh, you uh, suggested in your account of Dieppe that either Creerar or McNaughton or both could have stood up to Mountbatten. Uh, I'm going to throw at you that quite possibly until Dieppe happened, no colonial officer could have stood up to Mountbatten. Okay, the question is, could, uh, could Creera and McNaughton have stood up to Mountbatten? Um, I think the main answer is that they didn't want to anyway, so it kind of became academic. Uh, Creera had done everything in his power to make sure the Canadians were part of this operation. Uh, he had lobbied General Allenbrook, the Chief of the Imperial General Staff, to have Canadians chosen for this operation. Uh, General Roberts, the commander and sort of scapegoat of the whole operation, came to Creerar more than once and had serious reservations when they decided not to use the bombing uh, campaign that was supposed to go as a prelude uh, and, uh, and that they were not going to use any battleships in support of Dieppe. Uh, and uh, Creerar just flatly turned him down. So. Uh, so I don't think uh, Creer are, I think they actually could have, but I, there, there was no interest in them doing so. Other question? Yes, yes sir. Sir, um, you chose Dieppe as a disaster. Why didn't you pick Hong Kong as an equal, if not greater, disaster? Yes. I, I said in the, uh, in the introduction that there were a, a number of choices that could have been made. And you're absolutely right. Hong Kong was a disaster of the first order. Great many people died. And of course, we have George McDonnell here tonight, who is a survivor of Hong Kong. So it certainly could have been picked. Uh, you know, the, the, the 10 that I chose uh, were the ones that seemed to, to, to be most resonant to me. And another person might easily have picked five or six other ones. Uh, and you're absolutely right. It was it was an unmitigated disaster, and and how the whole thing uh, began and how it evolved is is a, a a complete tragedy. So the answer is it could very well have been. What I did in the end was I had like 14 or so possibilities, and I kept moving them around. Uh, literally had them all written down, and uh, and was trying to decide which. Uh, ones to include and which ones to leave out. I could have said, I suppose, 11 decisions or 13 decisions or something, uh, but at a certain point it becomes very unwieldy. Another uh, significant omission, I think, is the appointment of Admiral Murray as uh, uh, commander uh, 
of the Northwest Atlantic. He was, uh, Gen Admiral Murray was the only Canadian who became a theater commander. Uh, I might also have chosen the formation of the first Canadian army. This was, uh, you know, the only time Canada has ever had, or likely ever will have, uh, an army uh, formation uh, on the field of battle in uh, 1945. So uh, I think that was a very significant uh, decision too. So um, uh, if you uh, if you don't accept the ten that I named, I, I'm I'm not surprised, and I think the two of us could talk about it. Probably others have choices that they might have made. It's uh, I'm the first to say it's not a it's not nothing written in stone about the ten that I picked. Other questions? Yes, sir. <coughs> this is not a question, but a comment on how many memories you've touched on for me. First off, when I graduated and got my wings as a pilot, we had a banquet at the end, and they showed the captain of the clouds. Secondly, uh, the day after Dieppe, I was a soldier with the Canadians waiting for something to happen. McNaughton's traveling circus. The day after Dieppe, I picked up on the lawn near our billets a pamphlet that said, we and the Americans, Dieppe, no, we and the, Can and the British attacked Dieppe. And it was signed as a being from a Canadian, an American newspaper. Didn't mention Canada. And secondly, uh, or I guess his third, I guess. I knew a man who came, finished after all his training, finally posted to operations as a pilot, Canadian, to a squad, a British squadron in Burma, before he ever got his first uh, operational flight in, he was pulled out to be Canadianized into a Canadian squadron. And then those Canadian trucks, they were in Burma, they had one failing, that the uh, fuel pump diaphragm failed very often, and the soldiers would cut their leather jerkins to make a, a new uh, pamphlet in the, in, the, uh, in the fuel pump. But when I last went back to Burma, those trucks were still working. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for One more, if there's one more. Yes, sir. I was just, I'm just uh, having trouble with his light, sorry. More, more looking for your opinion. Uh, the various book I've, I've read about the Falaise Gap and who's to blame and yes. who's to have done it, uh, especially if you read non-Canadian authors, the, the, <laughs> the country of Canada comes up often. What are your views yeah. on, based on your research? Well, uh, first of all, this is a topic that you could spend uh, <laughs> A whole two hours on and if you're writing books you could probably write 20 books on this very same topic because it was the one opportunity that Canada had to to be involved in a strategically significant battle right this was the, this was the moment where the whole thing hung in the balance and the question at Falaise was whether the war would end in 1944 or not if they could somehow crack the nut at Falaise and trap this entire army uh, then probably the war would end in 44. But if they were not able to do it, then probably the war would have to go on to 1945. So it was considered a kind of disaster. This is Patton's Gap, it's sometimes called, right? The, the Americans are coming in from the west, Canadians coming uh, down from the north, and they failed to, and British, and they failed to kind of really grasp each other's hands properly. And so a lot of the Germans, but none of their equipment, managed to escape. I think as far as the Canadians are concerned, the number one problem was that it was a green formation. The uh, two corps at that point had only been formed a few weeks before. And, you know, when you take an organization of 70,000 people who all have to work together, every person has a job, the jobs have to interrelate, this person has to know what that person is doing. When you take an organization that's that huge, it takes time to shake down, and the Canadians simply did not have time. So it was, a, it was the inexperience, not the courage, 
of the Canadians that was the problem. I also should mention that General Montgomery uh, has been criticized Americans by Americans. Goodness knows that's never happened before. Uh, it's criticized by the Americans because he had a British division that he could have used but didn't. And I don't think it's ever really been established why he chose the Canadian uh, divisions to lead that attack when he had a British division that was ready and able to go. So the short answer is there's tons of blame to go around. The Americans too. I think General Bradley uh, kind of really it's stunning to think that he would have allowed the Americans not to advance to contact, you know? Like, why did they, why did they stop? They, all you had to do was keep going. They were afraid of firing on each other, which is a serious problem. But you tell them, the British are just over that hill, so watch out, but keep going. So the Americans have their own answers. The Americans are very uh, fond of blaming Montgomery and Canadians and everybody else, and you're quite right. If you read non-Canadian authors about fillets, it's the Canadians that were the problem. But, you know, there was plenty of reasons uh, why the uh, why fillets gap was not closed quicker. And, and, and it really was significant that they were not able to do it. Okay, if that's all right, I'll stop there. Is that okay, Pat? This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives on our website at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the Institute, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thanks for joining us.